Building a better Bay Area. Moving forward, finding solutions. This is ABC 7 News. Hi there, I'm Kristen Z. You're watching Getting Answers live on ABC7. We always ask questions uh, to experts for you every day at 3 to get answers for you in real time. Now today, the future of JFK Drive in Golden Gate Park. Um, will cars be allowed at all? That is up at stake being decided. So a meeting today will in fact answer that. Our media partner, the San Francisco Standard, will join us with a preview. Also, it's estimated that it'll take over 135 years to close the gender gap globally. A summit in San Francisco tomorrow and Thursday seeks to accelerate progress. And we'll talk with the CEO of the Institute for Women's Policy Research. But first, COVID cases are on the rise again. And one demographic group where numbers are up sharply is children. There were 37,000 new pediatric infections reported last week in the U.S., up over 40 percent from two weeks ago. So joining us now to talk about what's happening with kids and COVID is Stanford Pediatric Infectious Disease Specialist, Dr. Yvonne Maldonado. Dr. Maldonado, good to see you. Thanks for your time today. Good to see you. Thank you, Kristen. I hope those are the correct numbers. I know those are the reported numbers, but do you think the actual numbers are higher? Yeah, the report comes from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And what they do is they uh, really pull together the data from all of the state websites and mm -hmm. some of the city websites. So for example, New York City, et cetera. And so they really compile whatever the cities have put together. So it may be a little different from what the CDC numbers look like because um, reporting is a little different from state to state. Okay, but nonetheless, is that 40% rise uh, over the past week accurate, you think? And, and is that the first uptick in quite a while? Yeah, I think, you know, the big picture here, it's really the first time uh, that we've had consistent data about children. So when the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, first put out this report um, back uh, last year, it was really the first time we had any data on, uh, you know, cumulative cases in kids. And so even if it's not perfectly accurate. It really does reflect the trends that we're seeing across the country. And we are seeing an increase. Obviously, um, we're seeing a small upticks everywhere. I think the main issue here is what does this mean for children in terms of overall health? And I think um, that's what we're all watching for now. Can you give us the main bullet points that you want our viewers to take away from this data? Yeah, um, what we're seeing, of course, in children is that uh, it reflects what we're seeing in adults. So children are going back to school or been back to school now. Uh, they're traveling with their families. And unfortunately, we're not seeing a lot of kids being vaccinated. So children are uh, more likely to be um, getting infected over the last several months, especially after Omicron. So we, uh, we aren't seeing the Omicron surge at this point. Clearly, that was the highest point for all infections in adults and children. Mm -hmm. We're much lower than that, but we're starting to head up a little bit. So we want parents to know that we don't want to prevent every sniffle or every cold, but we do want to make sure that all children are protected so that they don't get sick enough to have to go to the hospital um, and have long COVID, for example. What percentage of 12 to 17 year olds have been vaccinated? Well, the numbers are un really um, not uh, really exciting for kids. So as we know, the older you are, the more likely you are to be vaccinated. So we look at the numbers for people 65 and older, and they are very high. They're over 80 percent. Um, but as you get younger, uh, the numbers drop. And for children um, 12 to 17, the numbers are about 68 percent. So uh, really about two thirds of our children mm -hmm. uh, who are 12 to 17 years of age are now vaccinated and children five to 11, only about 28 percent of them are vaccinated. So just about one in three children who are eligible for vaccination uh, between five and 11 are vaccinated and about two out of three 12 to 17 year olds. So we really need to do a better job. And my sense is that this is because of risk perception. So I think there's um, a lot of um, uh, co concern that uh, that the message isn't getting out that children can be hospitalized and can get very sick. Um, most children, fortunately, are not going to get very sick, but we just don't have a way right now of predicting who those children are going to be. So if you think about, for example, the meningitis vaccine, where we have very few cases in this country of meningitis um, in children. But yet the vaccines are, uh, the uptake for those vaccines is pretty robust. 
Um, and it's a rare disease, but I think people just see that it's, you know, when you have meningitis, it's obviously so dramatic and, and horrible to see. And I don't think people are recognizing that there are a subset of children who have COVID who can get very ill and even require being on a ventilator. So um, it is really a matter of perception about the level of severity of the disease in some children. Yeah, and it's also the anecdotal experiences or stories that you hear from your friends and your friends' kids, and it seems like everybody in that age group says, oh, it was like a cold, or maybe they had a fever, right? Um, but are they underestimating the risk for long COVID? I mean, I feel like so little is known about that. And as a parent, I'm not that worried about my kiddo, you know, having a fever for a few days, but I'm really worried if you tell me they might lose their sense of smell or taste for maybe forever. Yeah, you know, that's a really good point. And there have been millions of dollars invested in looking at long COVID in children and in adults, but it does take a long time to track and register those cases. So recruiting people into these studies and following them over time just does take a long time. And to really understand why they have long COVID is even going to be more difficult because it requires laboratory analysis, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But what we do know right now is about maybe 10 to 30% of uh, children and even adults may have long COVID. That defi is defined as symptoms that last more than 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, yes. The other thing that I'm wondering about is, is there uh, robust data to show of the small percentage of kids who do have really bad outcomes that require hospitalization, get very ill, um, is there a percentage on what percentage of those kids are vaccinated versus unvaccinated? Oh, absolutely. It turns out that the vast majority, I would say over 90% of those children who are in the hospital are unvaccinated, 90%. Okay. Um, and that's very close to what we're seeing in adults as well. So it's absolutely true while we do want boosters and we want other um, you know, masks, et cetera, we wanna make sure people are protected. Clearly the best protection against being hospitalized is being vaccinated. All right, but let's talk about that because there's still no approved vaccination in this country for kids under five. Um, the latest I'm hearing is that we're looking at maybe June and maybe they were kind of waiting to have Moderna and Pfizer come out at the same time to avoid confusion. Can you explain uh, what that's about? Well, um, just full disclosure, we are doing some of the pediatric Pfizer trials here at Stanford. Um, so, but I, but having said that, I don't know what the company's decisions are or how they make them. Uh, we really are just doing the study blinded, as we say. That is, we don't know who's getting the vaccine or who's getting placebo, so we can maintain the objective uh, uh, analysis. But having said that, um, yeah, the the as you probably remember. The five to 11 year olds vaccine was approved in November under emergency use. Um, and that vaccine in two doses at a, a 10 microgram dose worked very well. That dose is about a third of the adult dose. Now the children under five um, did not tolerate the, the even the 10 microgram dose. It was a little too strong for them in terms of having uh, fever reactions. Mm -hmm. So the younger children under five are getting the three microgram dose. It's, it's a, about a third of the, the five to 11 year old dose and a 10th of the adult dose. So it is a smaller dose. They tolerate that very well, mm -hmm. but the two dose regimen didn't work. So now mm -hmm. we're giving another dose. We're giving a third dose uh, to those children six months after they got the second dose. And we're finishing those trials up. And we just heard today that from a, a, re, a report that the company released um, publicly, that they are planning on submitting the data for the three dose study for children under five sometime this quarter. We don't know when exactly. Okay. And Moderna is already submitting their data. So uh -huh. it's being reviewed. And the question as you brought up is, should they be vaccinated? Uh, should they be reviewed at the same time or not? And there are a lot of opinions about what we should be doing. We generally don't wait for one product to be ready uh, to be able to review another product. Generally, they're reviewed independently of one another. Yeah, I mean, for parents under, you know, with kids under five who have been waiting for this forever, uh, they, they want something. So we'll see if yeah. that happens by June. Um, do you think mandates or the vaccine mandate is still necessary for school entry? As you know, California pushed that back uh, in a bill to make that one of the, you know, regular vaccines you have to get to, to be able to go to school. That's been withdrawn too. Um, you know, do you think it'll still happen? And do you think it's necessary? 
Well, you know, I would like to say it's not necessary, but we see what our vaccination rates look like. On the other hand, it's a third rail topic. And you, you, you know, you and I, Kristen, know that how uh, difficult it is, especially during this uh, election year to try to do anything that is really going to rile people up and nothing has gotten people more agitated and emotional for obvious reasons than uh, vaccines and kids um, on both sides, on all sides. So I think um, it's going to be hard to know whether we're going to have a mandate at this point. It would be great if people could just get their children vaccinated. And some data that I've reviewed suggests that if you provide people a high, a strong recommendation or a mandate, but you give them some ways to opt out, mm -hmm. that works the best. Um, so we'll just have to see what winds up happening. But it would be great to treat this as we treat all other diseases in kids. Before we go, I'd like to just ask you real quickly about the new CDC data. I think it came out today saying three in four children may have now survived a case of COVID. Uh, yeah. Is that right? That number sounds really high. What do you make of that? And does that bode well for herd immunity? Well, so um, it turns out that the state, uh, the, the federal government tracks antibody data across the country in a representative sample for all ages, and they track antibody data to the virus, not just to the spike protein, because the spike is from the vaccine. The antibody to the spike is usually from the vaccine. So they track antibodies to the whole virus, and they've seen that about uh, half of the U.S. population has now been infected. But interestingly enough, the infection rate is highest in the youngest individual. So the younger you are, the more likely you are to be infected. And that number is at around 70% for children under 17. And it isn't, I don't think it's a mistake that the higher uh, percentage you are vaccinated, the less likely you are to be infected. So we know that while the vaccine doesn't all prevent in all infections, it certainly does uh, reflect a reduced risk of infection. And that is still the main message. Uh, Dr. Yvonne yep. Maldonado of Stanford, thank you so very much for joining us today. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Thank you, Kristen. Coming up, it's a topic that has sparked some fierce debate. The future of Golden Gate Park's JFK Drive. Will it stay car-free? Discussion happening right now at City Hall. We're talking to our media partner, the San Francisco Standard, about this issue. We'll be right back. All right, everybody, enjoy this lovely outside shot that our director has ready for you. A moment of zen at Santa Cruz Beach.
Welcome back. Two competing proposals for the future of JFK Drive in Golden Gate Park will be up for a vote today. One of them would keep the drive totally free of cars indefinitely. The other would allow cars on only part of the drive. Our media partner, the San Francisco Standard, is following this closely and joining us live now to talk about how this vote could go. Standard's uh, senior reporter, Josh Kane. Hi, Josh. How are you doing? Thanks for joining us. Hey, Kristen, thank you for having me. How are you? Good, thanks. I understand that meeting's going on now. I think people are having kind of a fierce debate in public comments, right? And that vote is happening soon. Where are we at? Yeah, right now we're still in the pu public comment section. Uh, it's a pretty lively discussion. You've got some people uh, playing guitar as they uh, give their pitch for keeping JFK Drive car free. Uh, another uh, gave a, uh, a rhyming couplet, I, I believe. Uh, you had uh, children on bikes deployed in a rally this morning just to make sure that the point has been proven that uh, parents want JFK <laughs> drive car free for the indefinite future. Mm -hmm. And we are hoping that a vote is gonna be coming sometime in the next hour, but uh, there's still a lot in the air. That's a totally San Francisco kind of public comment. I do hope to see that in your Hella news coming out the next episode um, <laughs> of your comedy news. But I, I want to ask you, though, break down the issue for us, right? Uh, whether cars could be on JFK Drive in Golden Gate Park at all, um, there are certainly passionate people on both sides. Explain what has been going on and what the contention is with this. Absolutely. So. The closure of cars to JFK Drive, the eastern span, goes back to about six weeks into the pandemic in late April 2020. Uh, the idea was, you know, we got to get ourselves a little bit more space, uh, be uh, as health conscious as possible. And so they closed the road and, and people loved it. Uh, you had cyclists, pedestrians, uh, parents with their children playing in the road. Um, and that's something obviously you can't do when you have cars uh, driving by. And so it was really a hit. And since about the spring of last year, as we started to come out of the pandemic, there was then a push uh, by certain groups to get cars back on the road. Uh, most of this has actually been fueled by the Fine Arts Museum Agency here in San Francisco, which has a couple of nonprofits, uh, one of which oversees the De Young Museum and the Legion of Honor. Uh. And they have seen a lot of uh, attendance drop during the pandemic, obviously, because people couldn't come now that it's been reopened. They've been making a huge push to really uh, get that road open to give more access, uh, particularly, they argue, for seniors and the disabled. I see. And the California Academy of Sciences, that's there as well on JFK. So uh, I can see how for them feeling like having the roads open and, and cars, visitors being able to come would help them. OK, so tell us about the two options on the table, right? Uh, there's Mayor Breeds and then Supervisor Chance. Real quickly, break down what the difference is between those. Yeah, absolutely. So Mayor Breed's plan is to keep JFK Drive car free for the foreseeable future. Uh, she has uh, heard all of the benefits that people say, uh, particularly uh, parents that live in the neighborhood. There's been the SF Bike Coalition and others, uh, a group called Kid uh, Safe SF uh, that's lobbied pretty hard for this as well to keep it closed to cars. Um, Mayor Breed seems pretty open to that, and so do uh, a few supervisors. Uh, the vote still has to be taken. But on the other side, you have Supervisor Connie Chan, who represents the Sunset District area, which is part of uh, Golden Gate Park, is included in that. Uh, she has said that uh, she's concerned about seniors, um, uh, communities of color that, that may have not uh, the same equitable access to the park by living further out and not being able to drive and park uh, yeah. because the closure of the road got rid of about 300 uh, parking spaces. So those are the two competing agendas. So I understand there was an equity study done as well. Um, did the findings there align with Supervisor Chance then or, or not? Well, actually, uh, the equity study kind of leans a little bit more towards Breed's side. Uh, there were findings that actually uh, certain neighborhoods that uh, traditionally don't use Golden Gate Park as much had seen uh, lower attendance. However, uh, by and large, the equity study found that actually uh, the closure of J JFK Drive has not been as detrimental as some people have made it out to be. Um, what about the traffic issue? I mean, we've seen it long enough, right? Um, has it become a problem at all traffic wise to, you know, have JFK close and people having to take a different route? 
You know, it, it really depends who you uh, speak to. Uh, I did a story a few weeks ago about uh, the De Young Museum's contention, and they would say it's, you know, screwing up deliveries to the museum. It's making it harder for people to get access to the facilities. Um, there is a massive parking garage underneath the De Young Museum that sits pretty much empty at all times. Mm -hmm. uh, people would also argue, though, that the uh, prices of parking in that garage are exorbitant, and so it's not really the same as being able to park a short distance away and walk. Um, yeah. the, the kids, the, the uh, safe streets advocates would tell you, hey, this is actually really working. We are seeing accidents and, and obviously any traffic fatalities are not occurring. Uh, so it's actually been this great thing. I had one person tell me that it's literally the best thing that's ever happened to their children, which is a little bit suspect. But, uh, you know, I think I think it, uh, it does speak to just how passionate people are mm -hmm. to have this great open space. All right. Well, Josh, I do understand that it's very close. Uh, each plan has a few supervisors seemingly behind it. So we'll see how this all shakes out. Thanks for keeping us posted. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Kristen. All right. We do have links to the San Francisco Standard's other original reporting on our website, abc7news.com. And to watch more ABC7 segments featuring the San Francisco Standard's city-focused journalism, check out our ABC7 Bay Area streaming TV app. Coming up, a two-day event highlighting a fundamental human right, gender equality. We'll talk with the organizer of the first-ever Power Plus Summit about her mission. Coming up. All right, everybody, please enjoy another lovely view of our beautiful Bay Area. This is what, Marin Headlands? Or East Bay Hills? Okay, be right back. Welcome back. Advancing equality for women around the world is the goal of a summit happening this week. It's called the Power Plus Summit, and it's kicking off tomorrow in San Francisco in person and virtually. The Institute for Women's Policy Research is hosting the event, and it features dozens of speakers who aim to inspire and empower women and girls. Joining us live to talk about it, the president and CEO of the Institute for Women's Policy Research, Dr. C. Nicole Mason. Dr. Mason, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, so excited to hear more about the summit. But before we talk about the summit, um, let's talk about why it's even necessary. What are the many inequities women face today that demand progress and change? So it's been a rough two years, two and a half years for women. Uh, the pandemic really dealt a devastating blow. Um, before the pandemic, women made up 50% of the workforce, and by March of 2020, all those gains had been wiped out. Um, the pay gap is really still wide for women. Women earn 84 cents on the dollar for every dollar a man earns, and what and it has only closed about uh, 20 cents in the last five decades. So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, women are represented 
uh, across sectors um, in the in the C-suite. And uh, again, we are coming out of the pandemic. Women are still struggling with childcare and other demands. So this summit comes at a really perfect time where we're thinking about how we might create a society, uh, an economy that works for everyone. And this summit is really just reflective of the work that you're always doing at the Institute for Women's Policy Research, right? Absolutely. Uh, the, the Institute for Women's Policy Research is about 30 years old. We are the only think tank or organization focused on building women's long-term economic security and power and influence in society. So this mo in this moment, our work is more critical than ever. And so the summit is an opportunity for us to bring women across sectors together to really talk about how we might accelerate women's empower, power and influence. All right, I think it's really neat that this event is a hybrid, if you will. It's uh, the in-person part is in San Francisco, uh, but everyone is invited to the virtual event. Um, we have the website up. Do people need to register on the website? So absolutely. So to attend the virtual event, you just have to go to Power Plus 2020. 2022.com and sign up. Um, everyone is welcome. It's going to be a really great time. We have a, a phenomenal list of inspiring women and speakers all really thinking about this one question about how we might accelerate women's power and influence in society. And we want to make sure that it's accessible to everyone. Um, I think this conversation needs to go beyond power players in Washington and really reach um, everyday women. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm looking at the list of your speakers and their photos. I see that uh, first partner Jennifer Siebel Newsom uh, will be there receiving an award and also you have Congresswoman uh, Pramila Jayapal. Just a lot of inspirational women. But talk about the fact that I think philanthropist Melinda Gates is one of your partners, right? How does she get involved? So absolutely. Pivotal has been a partner of ours for a few years now, and the Power Plus Summit is just another opportunity for us to deepen our partnership and collaboration. Um, they've been on board and thought partners from the very beginning beginning of the summit, so has Foundation Chanel. Uh, we've been thinking about how we might really crack open um, this conversation about um, where we the progress we haven't made and the progress we need to make uh, for towards women's equality and um, equal rights. Well, if you want to be a part of this conversation, um, definitely check out powerplus2022.com. Dr. Nicole Mason, C. Nicole Mason, thank you so very much. Uh, congratulations in advance on the conference. Thanks for sharing. Thanks so much for having me. And we'll be right back. All right, everybody, we'll be right back.
Thank you for joining us for this edition of uh, Getting Answers. We'll be here every weekday at 3 o'clock on air and on live stream answering your questions. World News Tonight with David Muir is coming up next, and I'll see you back here at 4 o'clock. Bye-bye.